There's Melissa. Hi, Melissa. Hi, April. <clears throat> Sorry. Hi, April. I'm having trouble speaking. I'm oh. I'm masked, as you can see. We have COVID in the house, so. Oh, I'm sorry. How are you? Good. I'm good. It's good to good. see you. I'm sorry to, to you too. Yeah, everybody's doing okay. Yeah, okay. yeah. Sorry. Hi, Melissa. Hi, Anna. How are you? Good. Good. For those of you who came in a little bit um, later than some others, um, Alex is off checking to to see where Aaron, where Aaron, our um, host, is. So hopefully, things will start happening soon. <laughs> mm. oh, they're, they're How are you are always late. Doesn't matter whether they're online or in person. <laughs> Have you ever known a poetry reading start on time? True. Mm. It's comforting, really. Yeah, <laughs> like before times. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Um, it looks like our host is a wall. So I can't seem to get in touch with him, and so uh, I think we waited long enough, and. Uh, I'll try to be an impromptu host for you, for you all. <laughs> because even Karina, who is the organizer, is not here. So I don't know what's going on today. <laughs> so, so with that, I don't know what Aaron organized as to how the reading was going to progress. But usually, uh, in the absence of any other plans, we will go alphabetical. <laughs> and so, uh, I will start by uh, introducing Jacob and uh, followed, <laughs> followed by uh, Anna and then April. And uh, I think I don't have, I have just all uh, bios for all of you, which is what I'll use. <laughs> because probably Aaron had your most recent one. I don't know if you sent Aaron your most recent uh, bios, but uh, in the absence of that, I'll be the host for this evening <laughs> until Aaron shows up. So welcome all to our usual monthly Able Muse readings. And uh, I'm hosting for the first time. So hopefully I won't make too many mistakes <laughs> as we go along. Um, so with that said, I will start by introducing our first reader. And uh, our first reader is Jacob. And uh, Jacob M. Appel is a physician, attorney, and bioethicist based in New York City. He is the author of seven collections of short fiction, live novels, and a collection of essays. His short stories have been published in more than 200 journals and have been shortlisted for the O. Henry Award, Best American Short Stories, Best American Mystery Stories, Best American Non-Requited Reading, and the Pushcart Prize Anthology. His commentary on law, medicine, and ethics has appeared in the New York Times, New York Post, New York Daily News, Chicago Tribune, San Francisco Chronicle, Detroit Free Press, and other major newspapers. He has taught for years at Brown University and currently teaches at the Mount Sinai School of Medicine. The cynic in Extremis was a finalist for the 2017 Able Muse Book Award. And that is the book that got published by Able Muse Press. And with that, further ado, I'll get things going and uh, take it away, Jacob. Thank you, Alex. It's great to be here. Um, I appreciate the introduction, but for my mother, I'm still her son who's not the rabbi. Um, I, I will mention the most important thing you need to know about me is I am actually the psychiatrist on call tonight at the hospital. I'm in the psychiatric emergency room at the moment. Um, they have been warned not to interrupt, but if you see someone or hear overhead shouting for a psychiatrist, they think it's me and they made a mistake. Um, <laughs> so on a positive note, if any of you have a psychotic break on the Zoom call, you're in good hands. So 
before I was a psychiatrist, I used to be a tour guide and often conventions would hire people to entertain the spouses while they have a convention and tours were one of those. And this is a poem I wrote in response to that called Touring Greenwich Village. Spouses of dentists, wives and one husband and only me to guide them. The dentists are in an air conditioned ballroom near Midtown, absorbing the latest advances in articulating paper. I'd expected the wives and one husband to have better teeth. I had never given consideration to the spouses of dentists, which is likely why I agreed to leave this tour. Walking backwards on a summer day is hell on the calves. Willa Cather lived here, I say. Sarah Teasdale died there. Dental spouses nod politely, displaying chipped canines. I might add, this is where a poet, whose name you wouldn't recognize, wrote about a bridge I could easily sell you. Next, I might say, this is the spot where Hannibal led the elephants across the Alps. And over there, beyond that bus stop, hunchback Richard III, who may not actually have been hunchback, fell to Henry Tudor. And there, yes, right where you're all standing, brave Philippides proclaimed the Athenian victory over Persia before collapsing fatally onto the asphalt. At this moment, you spouses of dentists, I feel drained as Philippides, his marathon complete. Only that man saved civilization. While I stand on blister feet, watching you gawp at me with your poor occlusion, your ashy crowns, knowing we are leagues beyond rescue. Hmm. Now a poem I have written about my own uncle, who will never read this, which is why I can write this, because as you will see, my uncle does not believe in poetry or anything else uh, of the artistic bent. It is called the cynic in extremis. You could never put one over on my uncle. He, he whiffed the treachery in Girl Scouts, scoured his return change for Canadian pennies, steered clear of con games like synagogue and life insurance. His college education he invested in a tire shop, listed in his wife's name. Who would send a woman to prison over taxes? His breath stank of canned tuna. His politics lacked mercy. Alger Hiss, guilty. Julius Rosenberg, guilty. Sacco and Vanzetti, more likely than not. His gut fed on the raw meat of vindication. One evening, a white girl from a college came around petitioning for a pair of jail teens. Like the Scottsboro boys, he echoed, boys were probably guilty of something. I visit him in the old veterans home. My aunt is dead. Nobody else will go. Five days stubble quills the submerged jaw. He welcomes me as though I am a Brinks guard, serving him a sack of wooden nickels. Of course you've come, he says, slapping his palm against the bed sheet. You were always a sucker. <laughs> I will read something a little bit more entertaining called Flying with Clarity. Our flight attendant is older than I'm used to, maybe the oldest person on the flight, in fact, certainly old enough to know better. So when she announces that my seat cushion can double as a flotation device, that second mini amaretto urges me to rise like a loyal herald and shout, no, it cannot. I mean, has anyone, anywhere, in the entire history of aviation survived a catastrophic failure by floating away on a sliver of nylon? <laughs> Jesus Christ, lady, has it ever crossed your mind that steel tube cruising 500 miles per hour don't just skim the ocean gracefully like cormorants? No? They sink, 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 sink. You'd be swimming with the fishes around Davy Jones' yeah. locker if you survived the impact, which you wouldn't because you're old and out of shape and not made of graphene. And if by some miracle you did manage to grab hold of your cushion and paddle unscathed through the field of debris, hypothermia would kick in soon enough and in three minutes your rheumatic ice stiff fingers would lose their grip on a precious flotation device of yours, and you'd go the way of TWA and Pan Am and everyone else in your darn line of work who thought themselves unsinkable. And I will read one last poem of a more serious nature called 1939. In the courtyard of the yeshiva at Lemberg, after a cloistering rain, the boys burgeon and rustle like barley. Dawn gleams off the high stained glass. Tabernacle panels yet unshattered. Swallows nest jittery under the eaves. 
at the drinking pump, earnest young teachers in fringes and round rimless glasses steady the crowns of their humbers. Hitters of nerves among the pupils, hormones snickering, hands thrust into cotton pockets, toying marbles, apple cores, slingshots. A gout hobbled rabbi who was only 45, conclaved his wife's loud imperial nephew, visiting through the autumn from Breslau. And the streets still with Germanic names, and the cries of the city, the egg man hawking, clogged waist like a fowl, the horns and tires of motor cars, the knife shaver co coaxing his deaf bedeviled donkey from the muck. Surely appear the dawdlers, red eyed, dilly dallying, tremulous, a pudgy, indifferent lad kicking pebbles, brothers of twelve and thirteen, sweat mop, buoyant, pride slaked. A discarded tailor's dummy braced on their shoulders like a drunken mate, separated only by the beach mannequin and the nine months that will determine who walks right and who walks left. And on that note, I thank you very, very much. Thank you very much, uh, Jacob. Please, uh, you can unmute and give a big round of applause to Jacob. Terrific. Thank you. Terrific. Nice. Really nice. All right. So moving along, okay, uh, we'll now go on to our next uh, uh, next reader. And I'll find the page right here. Okay. So our next reader is Anna M. Evans. And most of you know Anna. Anna's poems have appeared in the Harvard Review, Atlanta Review, Rattle, American Arts Quarterly, and 32 Poems. She gained her MFA from Bennington College and is the editor of the Raintown Review. Recipient of fellowship from the McDowell Artists Colony and the Virginia Center for the Creative Arts, and the winner of the 2012 Rattle Poetry Prize Reader's Choice Award. She currently teaches at West Windsor Arts Center and Rowan College at Burlington County. Under Dark Waters, Surviving the Titanic is a special honoree of the 2017 Able Muse Award, and that is the a poetry book from Anna that was published by Abel News. And I give you Anna. <laughs> thank you, Alex. And thank you, Jacob. I particularly enjoyed the one about the dentists, uh, dentist spouses, I should say. Uh, so I'm going to read one poem from my most recent book, The Quarantina Chronicles. Then most of the poems are going to be from Under Dark Waters, because of course this is an Able Muse poetry reading. And then I'm going to read an excerpt from my upcoming manuscript, which has not yet been published. So that's what you can expect. The Quarantina Chronicles I wrote in April 2020. We all know what we were doing in April 2020, right? Not much. So I wrote this book basically every day in April. I took a news article. I put it in a word cloud. I took the, the top three or three of the top words that came out of the word cloud and I wrote a tritina using those words. So I will share one of those tritinas with you. It's called She'd worked for almost 30 years at the hospital and it has an epigraph from the news article, Detroit healthcare worker dies after being denied coronavirus test four times, daughter says. And that was from the 25th of April, 2020. She'd worked for almost 30 years at the hospital. In March, she experienced symptoms of coronavirus and drove there, but was refused a test. A week later, she was refused a second test and again sent away from that hospital. The third time, they said she most likely had the virus and to stay home as if she had coronavirus. The fourth time she went, they also didn't test. The fifth time, her family carried her to a different hospital. In this hospital, she died of the virus proved by the test. Sorry, it's not very cheerful. And in fact, Under Dark Waters Surviving the Titanic is also not very cheerful because as you might be able to guess, it is the story of my mother's death seen through the lens of the Titanic disaster. So yeah, um, as 
the reason for that is that um, my mother's death was very sudden. And so it was a little bit like an iceberg that we thought we would be able to get through and escape. And um, unfortunately, that didn't happen. The first half of the book is almost, sorry, the first third of the book, I should say, is, um, is entirely about the Titanic. So I'm mostly going to read from that because everybody loves the Titanic, right? It's such a great story. So I'm going to begin with, and I should say that everything in this book is true. Everything about the Titanic is true. I did lots of research for this book. Uh, I'm going to begin with the first book in the, I'm sorry, first poem in the book, which is a mirror sonnet. So it's a sonnet that reads down and then back up. And it's called Sister Ships. What an experience traveling on the Olympic. She is the flagship of the White Star Line. Compared to other ships, she looks gigantic. The epitome of luxury in design. Her first class cabins are spacious and opulent. She has a Turkish bath, a swimming pool. Many passengers are prominent in high society. She is a jewel. This is a truly marvelous time to be rich. It isn't quite so comfy in third class. And if by chance the voyage should hit a glitch, an iceberg say, nothing will come to pass. She is unsinkable, no need to fear. Look at her waiting at Southampton Pier. Look at her waiting at Southampton Pier. She is unsinkable. No need to fear an iceberg, say. Nothing will come to pass, even if the voyage should hit a glitch. It may not be so comfy in third class. This is a truly marvelous time to be rich in high society. She is a jewel. Many passengers are prominent. She has a Turkish bath, a swimming pool. Her first class cabins are spacious and opulent. The epitome of luxury and design. Compared to other ships, she is gigantic, the perfect flagship of the White Star Line. What an experience traveling on the Titanic. Yes, indeed, there were two of them. Now, you all know the story about the, uh, the band, the band that still was playing when the ship went down. So I actually had to write two poems about the band. Uh, I'm going to read the first one, which is actually while everyone was boarding the, the lifeboats, they were playing cheerful music to kind of keep everyone's spirits up. So this is called And the Band Was Playing Ragtime and has an epigraph from the famous book A Night to Remember by Walter Lord. Bandmaster Wallace Henry Hartley had assembled his men and the band was playing ragtime. Women and children first, the purser cries. The deck's tilt can no longer be ignored. Seeing the rigid faces, the wild eyes, Hartley gathers his boys and strikes a chord. Sweet syncopation rises in the air, jaunty rhythms that soothe the frightened crowd. Look, sings his violin, this is how men dare make tunes that break the rules and play them loud. The engine's silent now, so the music sways doomed men in steerage who grin and tap their feet. Brave men who share a smoke as the octet plays, melodies pulsing with life in every beat, all know the cold, hard death they're about to face. In the end, courage is all about the base. So uh, then we will read what I think is one of my favorite poems in the book. And I have to say that Alex did an absolutely marvelous job editing this book. This is an abecedarian called Animals of the Titanic. And once again, it is entirely true. Abecedarians are hard, especially when it gets to the end. Abecedarians, you know, you have to go through the alphabet and every line starts with the letter of the alphabet. And when you get to the end, you've got to deal with X, Y, Z, and it's hard. So you'll see what I did about that. Animals of the Titanic. Astor's Airedale Kitty perished along with her owner. Then Captain Smith's Irish Wolfhound put ashore in Southampton. Chow Chow, left behind by Harry Anderson, drowned. Dog, a fox terrier, last seen swimming. English foxhounds, 100, booked an alternate passage. Frou-Frou, detached from her grip on Helen Bishop's gown, perished. Gamine de Picon, prize-winning French bulldog, drowned. Hens and roosters caged, Drowned. Isham, Anne Elizabeth, and her Great Dane, bodies recovered together. Jenny, ship's mouser, drowned. Kittens of Jenny, likewise. Lady, Pomeranian of first class passenger Margaret Hayes, survived. Mice and rats, free living, drowned. Newfoundland Wriggle, survivor and hero, 
apocryphal. Objections raised to the three dogs on the lifeboats, none. Pomeranian, belonging to Elizabeth Rothschild, survived. Quote, I refuse to get on the lifeboat without my dog. Rothschild, Martin, body never recovered. Sun Yat-sen, Pekingese of Henry Sleeper Harper, survived. Terrier and Spaniel of the Philadelphia Carters perished. Unconscionable, the 56 children left out of the lifeboats. Vacancies on the lifeboats, 40%. Wealthy survivors, 200 plus three dogs, and XYZ, and XYZ, and XYZ. See what I did there? Okay, I am going to read. Uh, okay, um, I'm going to read the last poem in the Titanic section of the book, which sort of links it to the rest of the book about my mother and my family and my own associations with the Titanic. Uh, and it's called A Meditation on Loss. And um, it has an epigraph, which is a children's song. And when I'm in the mood, which I am tonight, you lucky people, I sing the epigraph. Oh, they built the ship Titanic to sail the ocean blue, for they thought it was a ship that water would never go through. It was on its maiden trip that an iceberg hit the ship. It was sad when the great ship went down. Everyone know that? Yeah, okay. When death arrives on such a monstrous scale, it feels unreal which is of course made worse by all the ways that we retell the tale in stories, movies, songs, and even verse. Add to this how strange that world can sound with its rigid social structure and quaint clothes. A moral fable, 1500 drowned through arrogance. The fact is no one knows quite how we measure loss. It's not by lives, thousands die daily, diseases, famine, war? Is it the grief of the person who survives that makes a single loss hard to ignore? These deaths don't move me more than any other, but every day I live, I miss my mother. Okay, so now we're going into the second section, which is more about myself and, and my mother and my family. And, and this one sort of gives you the parallel between um, what we were going through and the Titanic. It's called Entering the Ice Field. Each year on my father's birthday, I called home and my mother answered. Then one year, she didn't. My father said she couldn't come to the phone. It was a lie or at best a semi-truth. I gave him his greetings, asked to speak to her. He said she couldn't said she was in the bath. So I offered to call back later, but I knew the way birds scatter before an impending storm, something was waiting for us, impossibly big, looming unavoidably in our path. Somewhere, somewhere in a different future, he takes the phone to her as he always did, and we chatter mindlessly, her head in a towel. I can hear the water sloshing around until she says, she needs to dry her hair. That day, I continued on high alert, knowing something was wrong, and still we forged full speed ahead as though the seas were clear, when all along the ice was waiting for us. I haven't read that one a lot, so um, <laughs> forgive me for a little emotional. Okay. Um, but all of, the, all of the poems are not, not miserable. Um, I've always been interested in the story of the Titanic. So I had gone with my daughters to see the Titanic exhibition. And uh, out of that, I wrote this villanelle, which has what's well, called On Visiting the Titanic Exhibition in Vegas with my teenage daughters. And has the epigraph from the famous movie, I'm the King of the World, Jack Dawson, James Cameron's Titanic. Trust me, I say, you're going to be enthralled. Curious, they wander toward the model ship. They are the undisputed queens of the world. The bills of lading, the lists of people killed, aren't that exciting to them, I bite my lip. Trust me, I'd said, you're going to be enthralled. 
But then we enter a room that's kept so cold, the genuine iceberg loses barely a drip. They are the undisputed queens of the world. And next a chamber where a swathe of the hold brought from the seabed is set up a vertical strip. Trust me, I'd said, I think they are enthralled. Of course, there's a place where the movie set's installed from the famous scene, this won't be cheap, I quip. But they are the undisputed queens of the world. My youngest stands at the bow, her arms unfurled. Her sister steadies her, one hand upon her hip. Trust me, she says, I can only watch enthralled. They are the undisputed queens of the world. Okay. Um, this is a contum from uh, the book, which is also a little uh, emotional. I, have, I can get emotional about this. Um, it's called, I made mistakes yet more could have been done. And if you actually were to get the book, which I 100% recommend, you'll see that there are parallels between the first half and the second half. So I made mistakes yet more could have been done is one of the things that one of the captains said, says, um, of the, the ship that didn't go rescue the Titanic, if you know the story. I made mistakes, yet more could have been done. They should have seen that she was very ill. The antibiotic wasn't the strongest one. I couldn't save her through my force of will. It's been a year, I wake up crying still. If only I'd insisted that we ran to emergency instead of waiting till I made mistakes. Yet more could have been done. Her doctors knew she'd fought cancer and won, but now got sick from just a little chill. When they sent her home with drugs like anyone, they should have seen that she was very ill. I watched her try to swallow every pill. She spat up phlegm as soon as she'd begun to eat. In hospital, she went downhill. The antibiotic wasn't the strongest one. I thought she was breathing food and told someone. The nurses fetched the doctor who said nil by mouth. They upped and upped the oxygen. I couldn't cure her through my force of will. They put the tube in and my voice got shrill. She breathed as if her rib cage weighed a ton, sedated, a coma. At last I chose to kill the machines. A couple of hours and it was done. I made mistakes. Okay, I'm gonna put that to one side. And I'm going to treat you, I think, I hope it's a treat, to an excerpt from the manuscript that I'm currently sending out. It is pretty much complete, but um, I obviously hasn't been picked up yet. And this is a, uh, a manuscript called States of Grace, and it's about my journey from England. You can hear that I came from England uh, to America and also about a very interesting and enlightening trip that I spent. Uh, I spent five days in Wisconsin this uh, summer, which for me as a sort of uh, English transplant to New Jersey was very strange. So the centerpiece of this uh, manuscript is a heroic crown of sonnets called States of Grace. It's the title poem. A title poem. I'm not gonna read them all, obviously don't worry. I'm going to read the first one, which is kind of a standalone poem in its own right. And then the last one, which if you know anything about heroic crowns of sonnets is actually a line from each of the intervening sonnets. So it'll give you a flavor. But again, if you want the book, you're going to have to wait until it comes out. So this is States of Grace, and it is dedicated to uh, DF, who was the friend I stayed with, and Wisconsin. One, Green Lake. Even the clouds look different, more defined. The lake is silver. Ripples flash like teal minnows before the bow. The wake behind is jubilantly frothy. This is real. You tell me stories of your lake life youth. They're tinged with silver too and glow with joy. The small boats end in counters. This is truth. You tell me how you met your man, a boy who made you laugh at parties. This is breath. A light wind makes a halo of your hair. I feel at ease with, although far from death, and take a deep gulp in of summer air to ask the question that this day makes clear, would I be you if I had grown up here? And then the final, you see there's a lot of it. <laughs> the final sonnet is this. Would I be you if I had grown up here? Each of us owns the hard won world she's built, won't be constrained behind a wall of fear. I tried to shake my mouth around the lilt. Remember that contentment is a choice and I would no way to make you think like me. In a rhythm that insisted I rejoice, you showed me how you live. 
it's heavenly. Surrender to the moment and be kind. And all these days were outside rules and time. You are the friend I'd always long to find, except for one big dissonance we rhyme. Is there, because you're like, yet unlike me, some hope for this sweet land of liberty? Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Anna, for that uh, wonderful reading and uh, wonderful story of the Titanic, <laughs> and amongst other things. Uh, please, let's all unmute and give a big round of applause to Anna. Absolutely terrific. Absolutely terrific. A knockout. Bravo. Bravo. Nice. Really nice. Thank you. Go buy the book. <laughs> I will. It'll be good. All right. So, con moving along, uh, We'll now come to our last reader, and uh, that's April. And now, for most of you, probably know that April is also a novelist, just like uh, Jacob. <laughs> so we have two novelists in our midst today, uh, who are also poets, by the way. So April Lindner's first poetry collection, Skin, received the Walt, Walt McDonald First Book Prize from Texas, Tech University Press. Her novel, Jane, a Modern modernization of Jane Eyre, was published by Poppy, which is a, an imprint of Little Brown, in 2010. Catherine, a modernization of Wuthering Heights, is forthcoming, actually has been published in 2013. A professor of English at St. Joseph's University. April lives in Havertown, Pennsylvania with her husband and sons. And April, take it away. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much, Alex. Um, and thanks to my fellow poets for um, their wonderful readings and to all of you for being here. Um, and I too, um, by coincidence or not, have some poems um, about my mother um, who passed away about a year and a half ago. Um, and since then I have found myself writing obsessively about her, trying to explore um, some of the um, things that remain mysterious about our relationship. And um, this, the first poem I'm going to read um, is, the title is, um, pays tribute to two of her favorite concoctions. If you haven't heard of one or the other, the poem explains what they are. Um, so it should be pretty clear. And the title is White Shoulders and Strega. If her flesh were perfume, it would be white shoulders, tenderest of scents, gardenia, tuberose, lilies of the valley. In the bottle she kept to crown her white vanity, doled out one costly drop behind each ear, it conjured pink crinoline, floating opals, a stole of imitation mink. Evening spent basking in barlight, tipping a long-stemmed glass between her fingers, sipping its syrupy brew. Saffron, fennel, and mint. Sweet but mean, it made her throat burn cold. I'm sorry, it made her throat burn gold. Her chosen potions mingled, aura of the woman she was, softness of a wound, hardness of a scar. And that is the first time I've read that poem. And I realize now um, that I probably should have explained that strega is an Italian um, aperitif um, and the word strega means witch. So it's kind of a witch's brew. Um, and it's pretty, um, it's pretty powerful, heady stuff. So, um, and this poem also about my mother um, is titled Good Girl. So I guess you could say it's about me and my sister too. Um, and sorry, I'm scrambling to find the phone. And there it is. Good girl. Once she handed me her just lit cigarette so she could do some backyard task. I was maybe 10 and all my life so far, that totem of the forbidden blazed all around me in the mouths of adults. Smoke clung to my clothes, gathered on long car rides, every ashtray over, overflowing, and the crushed butts, 
their foam filters lipstick smeared. The softly crumbling ash, its variations on a theme of gray, stirred in me a mingled fascination and revulsion. So even though this once I was not just permitted but bidden to touch one, to let its red eye burn toward my fingertips, it seemed a breathing thing. And I held it at arm's length, upright like a torch, so far from my lips, I couldn't even for the smallest of seconds be tempted. And then the last poem for my mom um, is called Pretty Boy. And the poem will explain why. And okay, where are you, pretty boy? I know you're in here. Sorry. Um, ah, here we are, pretty boy. I barely remember the beating of wings and my panic at his approach, straight for my face, all onrush and unruly wind, and how large he seemed. Parakeet my mother would cluck at, bestowing millet from her cupped palm. That's all, not whether he was turquoise or green, not his sleek cocked head, just how I would screech and flinch, imagining talons caught in my hair, scratching my eyes. Only that and then, the one time, when over cereal she said, gently, as if I'd mind, that she'd found pretty boy that morning on the floor of his cage, and, and the leaden certainty that somehow, by not loving him, by not even liking, by being jealous of a pet so small, I'd wished him gone and he'd obeyed. So this morning, Facebook reminded me, as it likes to do, that 10 years ago tonight, I was at a Bruce Springsteen concert at MetLife Stadium, and I was in the front row with my arms on the rail, and it was a pretty good night, you could say. Um, and um, so I thought I would read this poem from this Bed Our Body Shaped, which is my Able Muse uh, collection of which I am I'm um, pleased, with which I'm pleased. Um, and this poem, well, for those of you who are even just casual fan, fans of Bruce Springsteen, you might catch a few of his song titles sprinkled throughout the poem. But even if you don't, um, I think, I don't know. He's iconic enough. I think it will all be sort of, um, sort of familiar. So let's see. And the title is One Night Stand. The crowd drifts lightly into the arena, sifting through the stands, the harsh cement, and worn seats slowly softening with flesh till what was still and stony as a canyon begins to murmur, vibrate. Roadies swarm the stage, unwinding cables, setting out a gleaming sax, a battered Fender Esquire. Each item rates a scattered cheer. Technicians dangle in the rafters, poised to spill light from big black buckets. Someone taps a mic, then strums a chord, a flash of noise, to flood the room and shock the slouchers upright. When finally the lights flick out, a gasp precedes the roar of 20,000 voices like waves that rasp across a pebbled beach. The drummer slips on stage, then one by one, the rest, gilded by footlights, take their stations. The front man straps on his guitar, counts off, a one, a two, a one, two, three, four, fists, 20,000 of them pump in unison. The pulsing crowd like an anemone waves its grabby filaments convulsing toward its maw, the spotlit center where the singer dressed in denim, silver, silver chains and sweat, bends slightly at the knees and stomps one boot, leans back to wrench the lyrics out. The congregation screams along by heart, each straining to be heard, some shrieking out the names of hits. Forbidden cameras flash. Those swaying closest to the stage can feel the bass pulse through their chests, a second heartbeat, and pressure at their backs, barely restrained. The crush to meet his eyes, to touch his leg, to brush his strings or catch one of his picks, 
to hear the favorite song they've waited for, that one about unslakable desire. This is their moment. Now it's slipping past, too fast, his every move, a windmilled arm, a long slide on his knees, a mic stand twirl, a prophecy, his every phrase a cue to toss their love into the swelling tide. And when he yells goodnight and disappears, they flail their cell phones, blue electric squares, dancing in the dark like tattered rags, waved by the shipwrecked at an empty sky. And this one, also from this book, um, is about another different kind of um, peculiar love, I guess. Um, and the title is Charmed. Home from a party, the silver balloon followed me from room to room. It bumped the ceiling in my wake, morning to night. By some freak of draft or static, Electricity, it waltzed as if charmed. Why did it choose me, not my husband or sons, to chase? When the helium weakened, it sank to face level and bobbed, nodding assent to my every choice, still not content. For days it stalked unshakably. Its ribbon hung down, synecdoche, suggesting a torso, pathetic and spare. I turn and confront my reflected stare. As it grew wrinkled, it followed still, rubbing against me at ankle height till, annoyed, I tied it to a chair's back. In a distant corner, it dangles, slack, a slighted suitor or cast off pet. I should throw it out, but haven't yet. And one more from this book. Um, one of my favorite pieces of art is Bernini's um, statue of St. Teresa in Ecstasy. And this, um, that, that statue inspired this poem. The angel when he comes at last in a trumpet blast of light, glistens like a newborn, smooth of cheek and chest, his slender waist cinched in wind washed gauze. She'd willed this visit, prayed for days, refusing sleep and food. Now he appears beside her, naked arm drawn back. His fingertips caress a spear pointed at her heart. His smile betrays amusement. This could be the moment just before his arrow plunges through her breast, as if to pierce my very entrails, she would write. Or it could be the aftermath. Her heavy vestments lift and rustle, from their depths, she swoons, lips parted, body curling upward toward that flame-tipped arrow, that cauterizing point. And though the whole tableau is stone, she vibrates like a harp string as the hand draws back. One bare foot clings to earth as limp, she crests a wave of pain, surpassing sweetness, tasted once and hungered after. Now the soul is satisfied with nothing less. And that last line and a half is actually St. Teresa's own um, from her writing. So um, um, just, oh, just a couple more poems, just two, I think. Um, this one, actually the one, the one um, amendment I'd make to Alex's introduction is that I no longer live in, ha in Havertown, Pennsylvania. I've actually moved twice since then. Um, and the most recent time was three weeks ago. Um, and so if that's a lot of new neighbors to meet and to either um, like or be befriended by or have, you know, tension against. And this is a poem about my new neighbors here seem very nice, but this is about a time when we, um, I was less fortunate or maybe they were less fortunate to have me, I'm not sure which. The title is The Neighbors. Our houses stand like lovers, hip to hip, the only thing between a grassy strip. The fence an empty gesture, but we know them only well enough to say hello. Their pear tree dumps its produce in our yard, mealy and bewormed or green and hard. Our dogs annoy them, barking to get in, 
sniffing between pickets and the din when the teenage girl rehearses with her band reminds me just how middle-aged I am. The wife drags out the trash and mows the lawn in her sweatpants looking put upon. I've watched the undershirted husband preen, then glance my way, expecting to be seen. Etiquette demands we all pretend I'm looking at their lawn gnomes, not at them. Why do I dislike them? It's complex. We hear them break their dishes and have sex and bite back our own cries of rage and love out of concern for what they think of us. And one last poem. Today is the first, um, the first day of, of fall, I think, um, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, so we can officially start thinking about Thanksgiving. So I wanted to read this one last poem um, because it's actually about the scariest graveyard I've ever seen. Um, the trip to Brooklyn misremembered as a roller coaster ride. Lock your doors, they'd say, look straight ahead. Every other Saturday, we'd travel from Long Island to grandma's house in Brooklyn. My parents anxiously accelerating through neighborhoods they'd gladly left behind. In the back seat, secretly we thrilled with vertigo, craning our necks to gape at tenements and billboards. We admired the smashed out windows and oily graffiti so much more satisfying than the misdeeds we dared dream up. Buckled in the back seat, we drowsed, secure, but once dad took a wrong turn past a cemetery, not the first I'd seen, but enormous, rows and rows of headstones in strict formation, interspersed by obelisks and mausoleums dreadful in their heaviness. A graveyard gray and scalloped as the ocean and seemingly as endless, stretching on for blocks until I couldn't help but know the dead were gaining on the living. Soon they would be everywhere. I squinched my eyes, and counted 10, but when I peeked, we still were driving past tombstones that grew more ancient, pale and straight at first, but later crooked, dark with car exhaust, ground down by age, the way our grandmother kept get growing shorter. The city underground, crowded with bodies like the one above, each skeleton waiting in its windowless apartment, and everyone I'd ever grown to love would wind up buried here. Our Buick climbed the ramp onto the Brooklyn Queens Expressway, a clackety steep track. Chain scraped us onward, grinding toward a peak high as a skyscraper. A long pause, then the sudden giddy plunge, the Naga hide seats falling out be beneath us. We hovered, breathless, bracing for the drop. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, April. That was just marvelous reading. <laughs> and, uh, terrific. Uh, you know, just terrific. Uh, can we all uh, just unmute Absolutely. and give April a big round of applause? Thank you, April. Very nice. Very Thank nice. Thank you. Very, really nice. Thanks. So uh, it was just a wonderful reading from uh, Jacobs, uh, you know, so sometimes personal, sometimes storytelling poems. And uh, to Anna's uh, stories about Titanic and uh, family, and to April's uh, sometimes personal, sometimes universal <laughs> poems, all uh, just marvelous, all in your unique voices. So thank you all for such a great treat this evening. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> So now I will open up the floor to anyone who has any questions to any of our poets. <laughs> no questions. Yes. Does someone has, have a question? Don't, don't be shy. <laughs> Okay, if, if no one has any question, I think I'll ask our poets uh, a question of my own. I don't really have any question, but I think I'll try to ask you all the same question. What was the last poem you wrote and what inspired you to write it and how did you go about writing it? Do you want me to take this? Anyone, any of, yeah, go ahead. Anyone it just happens that I, I was transcribing the poem earlier, so right before it. 
I came on here, so it's very fresh in my mind. Um, this is actually, it's an interesting story, interesting story, it's kind of sad. My dog went blind, like shockingly, three, three or four weeks ago. She's only eight. And apparently there's this condition called SARDS, Sudden Acquired Retinal Degeneration Syndrome, which causes small female dogs that have been spayed to go blind at about the age eight. Who knew? So I felt like I had to, um, I had to commemorate this in some way in, uh, in verse. And uh, being me, of course, I wrote a sonnet about it. Um, and it's it's very it's a very literal sonnet. It's not as abstract as some of my sonnets, although you've heard from the Titanic ones, they're pretty um, literal sometimes anyway. But uh, basically, just talking about how the vet said that we we would um, we would develop a new closeness with her because apparently some people put these dogs down, and I mean that didn't even occur to me for a second. But so it was about how we would develop a new closeness with her, which has come to pass, I have to say. So yay, Piper! Piper got a sonnet. Oh, Here's a piper. <laughs> well, this morning I was working on a poem that I've been trying to write for um, uh, since the mid 1980s about um, I don't know this experience I used to have riding on a on a bus every night home through the dark from work to where I was living and. Um, passing what I thought for many years was um, a ghostly blue tinged Victorian lady playing the piano in the in the window of a library and over the years it finally dawned on me that no it was a you know somebody entering a librarian entering data in a computer probably but um, I've been trying for years to write this poem and I think I may be finished it this morning maybe I mean there's a line I'm still working on um, but um, yeah I don't know some poems just kind of I, well, there are there are things that you just sort of want to mysteries you want to solve, or and one of them is why something catches your attention and sticks in your head for for that many decades. But um, so that's my that's my latest poem. Well, that's very interesting. I, I have a, I have a couple of questions for Anna. This is Morgan. Uh, uh, before before that, let's have a uh, Jacob's answer first. Yeah, of course. Right. So I'm actually doing something very unusual. I'm writing a novel that is a retelling of The Great Gatsby from Jordan oh. Baker's point of view. And my challenge is to write really bad love poems written by Gatsby. Um, <laughs> so that's what I'm working on. Wonderful, <laughs> wonderful. Okay, someone had a question yes. for Anna. Yes, yes, I did. Uh, though to, to, to comment on what Jacob just said, writing well badly can be as hard as writing well, period. So, <laughs> congratulations, that sounds like fun. Uh, my, my question is primarily for Anna. It's, it's for everyone. But uh, first of all, um, since you write so extensively in form, I'm curious as to how often you approach a particular subject with the idea that you're going to conform to uh, a, a proper form, as opposed to, uh, do you ever let go and uh, you know let it all out and uh, start with free verse, or does does your uh, mind, you're so good at the sonnets, uh, tend to want to discipline that and follow the lines? And just um, on a lighter note, afterwards, if you would comment on how you feel uh, about the the, the recent uh, um, you know formalities in Britain as an English person, how did that look to you from New Jersey? Okay. <laughs> That's two very different questions. So uh, very different. <laughs> let's approach the first one, which I'm, I, I'm asked, uh, uh, it's not the first time I've heard it. So let's approach the first one first. Um, the sonnet is my default mode. And that is, in my opinion, because a, a, a 14 line poem that does what a sonnet does is the perfect length for many subjects that you want to discuss. You know, a sonnet sets up an argument and then it looks at it a different way, and then it wraps it all up in a bow and goes doo -doo. And, and you know that that is a a, a a good way of thinking about what poets need poems need to do. So the sonnet's my default go to, um, but sometimes I do look at a poem and uh, or a subject matter, and I think no, this has to be something else. So the the animals of the Titanic obviously always had to be an abecedarian because it was going to be a list poem. So that was that. Um, Villanelles are another thing, you know, I did, I read the Villanelle about my kids at the, um, at the Titanic Museum. With the Villanelle, the repetend has got to get more meaningful as you go through the poem. You can't just 
echo and echo and echo. It's got to get more impactful. Great example of that is Elizabeth Bishop's One Art, right? If you, ever, that's my, my, my opinion, not just one of the best villanelles ever, but also one of the best poems of the 20th century. Um, a Sestina, if you write a Sestina, you've got to be very clear that you're developing your topic, you know, just going round and round and round and round and round. So I, I do think, and there's a Sestina in Underdog Quarters as well. I do think about what the form is, but to answer that question with more detail, I do occasionally write free verse. It's, it's not common. Here's my issue. I'm really good at writing in form. I don't know if you knew that. But <laughs> I'm, I'm, no, I'm no better than anyone else at writing in free verse. So I was just thinking about this. It's like when I write in form, it's like I'm writing in free verse, but backwards in heels, like, you know, the whole Fred Astaire joke. Uh, Fred Astaire, Ginger Rogers. So um, I just, it's, it's what I'm good at. It suits me. So I do it. On to the Queen. <laughs> I, it did not occur to me to write a poem about the death of the Queen. In fact, I'm not sure I've ever, oh, I have written a poem about Elizabeth I, not Elizabeth II. I'm not really a monarchist per se. Obviously, I'm not even an American citizen anymore. Um, I watched a little bit of it. Uh, I felt sad. I, I teared up maybe one time, one time. Um, but it was not because I'm, I mean, people kept saying, or I heard people say, oh, this is a tragedy. It wasn't a tragedy. She was 96. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the plans for her death were laid 10 years ago. Like everyone, everyone knew this was going to happen at some point. If I lived to 96 and I've done half the things she did, I'd be like, ecstatic she met with the prime minister two days before she died i mean she was like working for the end. amazing woman amazing woman not sad super sad anyway does that answer your question morgan it, absolutely thank you <laughs> well thank you uh, all for, all three of you for those uh, fine answers uh, any more questions from our audience i think i see a hand carla has a, a question <laughs> Yes, go ahead. I'm Jacob Apple. I'm a huge fan of your short fiction. I must have Thank four you. of your books and I, I love them. And, you know, I'm always struck by your imagination. So, and I too have been writing short stories and, and I've been now writing poetry. And I'm curious whether you find that poet, when you're writing poetry, it's closer to memoir than it is to short fiction or whether you ever use the same tools that you're so good at using in your short stories when you're writing poems? I mean, that's a really good question. Um, and I guess the best answer I can give is most, most of my poems are persona poems, even the ones that sound like me really aren't. Um, so I am very reluctant ever to share anything about me. And I think that's because I'm a psychiatrist and anything I really share about me, my patients will Beyond the obvious the psychogenetic reasons, my patients will come across as ammunition, um, and I'm always fearful of that. Interesting. That's a great question. I, I will so add, it by sounded the way, to my ear as if they were memoir poems, but I see now they're all persona. Um, I will add, by the way, I'm going to put my email in the chat. If anybody would like a free story collection or two, just send me a postal address, and I will have the publisher mail them to you. When you have a, pub, a, poet, um, a story collection come out, the week of a pandemic starting, they have a lot of leftover copies. Yeah. So they're all yours for free for the asking. That's wonderful. <laughs> well, I took a screenshot. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, so just go into the chat and you'll see uh, Jacob's uh, email there. Uh, I'm sure all of nobody you know. Asked, chat. <laughs> nobody asked me my thoughts on the queen, but I, I, am, I am sad that I didn't inherit. Um, I figured <laughs> I would at least get a corgi and I got nothing, so. <laughs> <laughs> Corgi's for everybody. <laughs> well, uh, is there any more question? I, actually, if there's no more question, I think I wanna do something that we did last time, which was get every poet to read one final poem before we the curtain come down. So if you're all up for it, I would like you all to select one final poem to read. Uh, and then uh, that will be it for this uh, evening's uh, proceedings. So I guess we'll start with this, 
the same order, unless you want to change around. Who is ready to go now? <laughs> I guess we'll go with whoever is ready to go first. <laughs> well, Anna is ready to go. Okay, Anna. <laughs> go <for it. laughs> okay. So this is um, interesting because, of course, what Morgan Reed asked me about form. This is actually a form I invented, Morgan. Um, it's called the haiku. So it's a sequence of haiku that can also be read as a pontoon, right? So that was a lot of fun to put together. I've written a few of these. It's called Underclass. And like many of the poems in the uh, book, it has an epigraph. Mary refused to be parted from John under the women and children first edict and was lost in the sinking. Black ice in my veins. I can't see my husband, John, the man I stayed with. Sleep pulls me under. I can't see John, my husband. Someone's crying out. Sleep pulls me under, beneath the water again. Someone's crying out in the name of God, beneath the water again, my mouth full of brine. In the name of God, can anybody hear us? My mouth full of brine, freezing bitter tears. Can anybody hear us? The boats are far off, freezing bitter tears, cannot summon the nearest, the boats so far off. The man I stayed with cannot summon them nearest black ice in my veins. Very nice. Very well. Thank you very much, Anna. Yeah. Yeah. So who who's who's who wants to go next? <laughs> April, okay. I've oh, got April. one handy. Um, this is another one I've been trying to write for um, since the mid 80s. And I'm not exactly sure it's done, but I think it's done enough uh, for now. Um, and it's called Uncoupling. The year we lived beside the switching yard, each night the heavy coupling and uncoupling, the trembling walls, the creak and grind of iron made for uneasy sleep. I must have sensed we were about to end and didn't want to know what goal you ran toward in your dreams. To ward off words I couldn't bear to hear, I wore perfume, tried hacking off my curls, and when you said I wanted you too often, I tried to want you less, fought to ignore the way you had to drink too much to say the kind of words, kind words, I thirsted for. The trains that barreled past our rented house, New England Central Railroad had headed south, bore only cargo, pine trees felled and tethered, salvaged autos, milk sloshing in tanks. No cash could buy me passage out of town. And anyway, I thought what I desired was that dramatic joining and unjoining, the shutter of our gym crack shotgun home. I hadn't tasted yet the sheer momentum, earth liquefied, the thrill of floors that shift underfoot to snake around a curve the weight of no one's body against mine. No music but the murmuring of strangers, the steady click of the conductor's punch. Your ticket, please, as he waves up the aisle to strew his galaxy of paper moons. Powerful, really nice, really nice. Really. That's hard to follow. <laughs> um, so I guess I'm gonna read, uh, Carla will appreciate this. The only autobiographical poem is truly autobiographical in the collection called Summer Camp Socials. We journeyed by decommissioned school bus to all girls camps wedged into late front Berkshire notches, most now defunct, where Scarsdale bankers sent their daughters to weave lanyards. Wire poked through gashes in the vinyl seats. A toxic residue of antiperspirant choked the twilight. In the makeshift ballrooms, gymnasiums, moonlit refectories, a converted hay barn painted mauve, slender thighs flashed through clouds of Malibu musk. Boys breathed banaca like fire, savoring the first pretty tang, a Maybelline kissing potion. I hugged the corners like a dunce. At one camp, there was a bald girl, pale, lanky, not unpretty, but without so much as an eyebrow, her pregnant white scalp latticed with veins. On the bus, guy call, guys called her Kojak, snotted about parts she didn't need to shave. Nobody ever asked her to dance, yet her laughter carried across the salty ether. This girl stars in the revision of my life. I stride across the dance floor on fumes of bravado, let her faint 
waist melt into my trembling fingers. She ripples with joy, but not surprise, because she has known I am coming, because she's been waiting. In my unrevised life, she is still waiting. Very good. Yeah. Very nice. Very, nice. very nice. Powerful. Yeah. Thanks. You can really write more good. memoir. Really good. Yeah. <laughs> really nice. If anybody oh, ever oh, finds oh. that girl, I want to find out what happened to her. It's only <laughs> 45 years. <laughs> yeah. Well, any, any more questions uh, before we wrap things up? Well, uh, in the absence of any more questions, I think uh, this is, it has been a very fun evening and a very uh, wonderful reading from uh, both all our three poets tonight. And thank you all for your uh, participation and insightful questions and with that i've just left a link to uh the ablemuse.com website where you can sign up to a newsletter and also ablemusepress.com where you can find books from all of our three readers tonight and uh, support them by uh, ordering a copy yourself so thank you all for coming and i'll have the video recording for this uh, event uh, in a day or so, and I'll email everybody about it when that occurs. So thank you all, and I hope thank to see you, you next really. month. Thank you, nice reading. Thank you, Alex. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Rita. Thank you. Thank you. Just wanted to add really quickly, uh, emphasize, thank you all so much for participating. I know this is something extra in our busy lives, and so especially on a weeknight um, late. So thank you all so much. Um, and I'm sorry that I missed the first 20 minutes or so, but I'm glad I was able to make it on. Um, so I just wanted to say how much we really appreciate it. So I hope you all enjoy your evening, thank the rest you. of your evening. Bye. Thank you, Karina. Take care. Bye. Take care, Karina. Bye. Hey, buddy. I Thanks, Karina, host. <laughs> Take care, folks. Yeah, I know. Alex, stay on for a second. I want to talk. Sure. Oh, I'll, I'll, I'll be here. Bye. Bye-bye.